Hello everyone, thank you for joining us for today's Leading Change webinar, Building Community, Character, and Commitment, sponsored by Odysseyware. Before we begin, I'll provide a brief overview of what we're going to do here in the next hour. Stacey Adamchuk will be sharing her insights with us from her experience using the Circle of Courage philosophy with high school students at risk. During the presentation, please feel free to send in any questions that you have for Stacy. We'll be compiling the questions while she talks and then holding a Q&A at the end of the presentation. You will receive an email later today or tomorrow with a link to access the PowerPoint slides and a recording of the webinar, so keep an eye on your inbox for those materials. Now let's get started. I'm pleased to welcome Stacy Adamchuk today. Stacy is a lead teacher at Connects Learning Center, a four-district consortium high school in Wisconsin that was established to address the needs of students who did not experience success in a traditional high school environment. Stacy has been educating youth at risk since 2001. We're really excited to hear from Stacy today and to learn about her experiences with the Circle of Courage philosophy, so I'm going to hand things over to her now. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining me today. Um, I'm very honored to be able to talk about something that um, me and my staff are all very passionate about. So Connects Learning Center was created in 2001 in response to No Child Left Behind. Our directors of people services from three neighboring school districts found that um, there was a population of students who were not finding success in a traditional high school environment. And so they wanted to create a program to address those students and their specific needs. So Lisa Kajawa from Oak Creek Franklin Joint School District, Kathy Dermody from South Milwaukee School District, and Jim Hyden from Cudahy School District joined forces and researched programs throughout the country to find what would be best for our set of students. And in all their travels, they came upon the Circle of Courage. And so um, they created a small environment, um, one teacher, one aide, 12 students. We were originally located in the warehouse of the Oak Creek Franklin District Office Building. Uh, it wasn't until later on that Franklin joined forces with the other three districts. And so originally, um, we used a lot of packet work and we used a land-based curriculum called Plato at the time. And that first year, we had three students graduate. Um, 15 years later now, um, with the last couple of years, we've been averaging about just over 100 students graduating. Every, every um, district who is part of our consortium takes on a responsibility. So for instance, Oak Creek takes care of the staffing and the building maintenance. We're all hired through Oak Creek School District. We participate in their staff development days. We follow their school district calendar. Our building that we have now is located in Cudahy. Cudahy is our fiscal agent, so they take care of all budgeting needs. South Milwaukee is actually right across the street. We are on the border of Cudahy and South Milwaukee, and they take care of all of our technology needs, our internet, buying our computers and Chromebooks, that kind of thing. And then Franklin is um, a community that's quite a bit further away than the other three, so they assist in the decision making. Um, in 2000, January of 2003, the consortium got together and realized that we needed a place of our own, that the warehouse was not working, we were slowly expanding. And so we rented a room out of a church, which is where we're located now. And over the years, they came to the conclusion that that one room in the church wasn't enough, so they bought the building. So now we are a three-room schoolhouse. We have two teachers, two aides. We work with about 72 students, and we have two classrooms. Um, the middle room serves as a community area and a break room for our students. And I will be showing you pictures in a little bit so you can kind of get an idea of what our environment looks like. 
Um, as far as staffing and support goes, we, like I said, two teachers, two aides. We do not have any on-site administrators, guidance counselors, or any additional support staff. However, the four school districts remain very involved in the education of their students. And so we have guidance counselors and administrators here monthly meeting with their students from their home school, checking in, making sure students are doing what they need to be doing, um, attending school, earning credits, all that fun stuff. The admission process at Connects Learning Center is unique. Um, students are identified by the student service team, pupil service people, um, so guidance counselors, administrators, social workers will meet monthly to discuss students who are potential candidates at Connects Learning Center. Oftentimes, families will come to us, or students on their own, and ask, to be admitted into our program. We always let them know that they need to be referred by one of the four school districts and that's who they need to contact. So once the student is identified by the student service team, a um, couple of things are put in place. If the student is a non-attending student, they might ask the student to show their willing to change their ways, come to school more often, because the only way they're going to be successful is by attending daily. And so they will ask them over a two-week period of time, come to the high school every day and show us you're committed. Um, so once that takes place, the student and the family will fill out an application, and the student is required to write a three-paragraph essay. Uh, the essay is their statement of why they would like to attend at Connects Learning Center, why they feel that they may not have been successful in the traditional environment, and why they do feel that Connects Learning Center would be a good environment for them. Um, those essays tell us volumes about the students. Um, some students share a lot of information, go into detail, and write far beyond the three paragraphs. Other students, um, still keep things bottled up, let very little out. Um, but it also lets us know the student's skill level as far as their communication and their writing skills. Uh, once the application and essay are complete, the student service team from the home high school forwards that to the staff here. We review the application and we contact the family to bring them in for an interview. And so, we usually have the student, the parent, or a guardian, uh, the administrator from the home high school, and the guidance counselor from the home high school. The interview process is 20 to 30 minutes, and we discuss our environment here at Connect. We talk to them about our circle of courage philosophy. We talk about the curriculum, and we talk about rules and expectations. We also, get to know the student a little bit better. We talk about their future and what they want to do or where their interests lie so that we can help them not only earn a high school diploma, but figure out what's next and come up with a plan. After we discuss all those different things, we ask the student if we feel that this is an environment that they will be successful in. And if they say yes, they believe they would be successful here, they are admitted into our program. Um, our school days are very short for the students. We have two three-hour sessions, so a student will attend one session and sometimes go back to their high school for the remainder of the day, and other times um, students will have a job or they are a parent or they have some other requirement to fulfill. We operate two sessions, 8 to 11 and 11.30 to 2.30. The whole basis of our program is the circle of courage. A circle of courage is a Native American philosophy for raising children, and it's based on resiliency research. Um, reclaiming youth at risk is almost like our school Bible. Um, it has a lot of 
great information in there. Um, and this is something that we live and breathe. All four staff members here are truly passionate about the circle of courage. There's four components, belonging, mastery, generosity, and independence. And again, this is, it's living and breathing, and we do this on a daily basis. We place most emphasis on the belonging aspect because we know that if students feel as though they're part of a community, they're more likely to attend school every day and be successful while they are at school. And so belonging is at the core of the circle, and you will see it woven throughout the other three components. We have found that the aspect of belonging is absent or distorted in most of the youth that we work with. When we say absent, we mean they do not feel like they fit in a traditional high school environment. Some do not have a great family life. Um, and when we say distorted, we have those very dysfunctional relationships or the gang type mentality that they believe it's a positive relationship, but it is not. Um, and so our commitment is to ensure that every student feels as though they belong. And we have so many different ways of doing that. Um, one of the things that is essential to remember is that we work with kids from four different school districts, which is pretty much unheard of, in, at least in this area. Um, four completely separate communities who are rivals in sports fields coming together to educate these, these students. And so because there are some of those built-in rivalries, the belonging aspect is essential. And so some of the ways that we promote belonging in our environment is doing daily and weekly circles, group activities, and expecting students to take ownership in the program and in their education. And so every day when we start the first 15 to 30 minutes, we gather in a circle. On Mondays, we start the day in a large circle gathering both classrooms, and we do team building exercises, and we do mastery and independence activities. We do personality tests. Um, sometimes we just play games. And then Tuesday through Friday, we meet within our own classroom in a smaller circle doing the same types of things. Um, we play Pictionary, we play Catchphrase. Sometimes we break out a, a book called Kid Chat and ask completely random questions. Some of them are things like, if snow could fall in any flavor, what flavor would you want it to fall in? And every student has the opportunity to answer that question. Sometimes it's a little bit more deep of a question. For instance, what if you found out you were adopted? Um, students laugh in these circles and they cry in these circles, but most of all, they develop these awesome bonds, um, not only with each other, but also with the staff. And we find within a short period of time that the students are no longer classmates, but they're a family. They're like brothers and sisters who sometimes bicker like brothers and sisters, but we do not have the drama here. We do not have fights, fist fights, any physical or verbal altercations in this environment. It just does not happen. And we attribute that to how much we put into these belonging activities. Um, we start our school year, the very first day of school, we take all of our students to a YMCA camp called Camp Minicani. It's high ropes, low ropes, team building. Um, eight hours in one day, the very first day of school, they're thrown together with 60 other kids they don't know to build relationships. And that has probably the largest impact of them all. Um, the next component of our circle um, that helps build character within our students is mastery. Um, mastery is about feeling competent and successful. It's brain-friendly learning. It's the educator being a talent scout. So some of the things we do to work with our students on their mastery is um, 
giving them coursework that is manageable but challenging. So typically, we now use Odyssey where probably is 80 to 90% of our coursework. We also have teacher-created packets. Um, we typically will give students a core class and an elective class. So a class that will challenge them and a class that they may be able to get through a little bit quicker so that they feel that success of getting through the class um, and they don't feel so overburdened by some of the more challenging work that they want to give up. And we celebrate all of their successes. When a student finishes a class and earns that half credit, I have a cowbell on my desk. My teaching partner has a gong in his classroom and they ring the bell or hit the gong to kind of announce to the rest of the school, I just finished a class. And kids celebrate. They cheer for each other. It's absolutely amazing to watch them celebrate not only their own success, but their classmates' success as well. We also celebrate the large accomplishments. When a student finishes all of their credits, no matter what time of year it is, it can be as early as October or late as June, we celebrate by throwing confetti. We will invite in the family and the administrator from their home high school, guidance counselor, any teacher that maybe they had a connection with from their home high school. Everyone grabs hands full of confetti and we throw it up in celebration. As you can see from the picture on the screen, this young man had quite a bit of confetti that day. Um, let's see. So we have some high expectations at Connects. We require our students to have 90% attendance or better. Now, for some students, um, that sounds nearly impossible. We have some um, students who are non-attenders at their high school. Now, to go from zero to 90 is, for many kids, a little bit too high. But as long as they're making gains, if they've gone from zero to 60 and continue to slowly rise, uh, we celebrate that. We, in, we just keep encouraging them to do better. If a student is a typical, you know, a good attending student and they start to fall below that 90%, we call in a team of people to sit down and strategize with the students about things we can do to help them attend more often. And so um, usually that team consists of a guidance counselor, administrator, and a parent or guardian or an advocate of some type. So some, uh, sometimes it is moving a student from the morning session to the afternoon session if they have trouble getting up in the morning. Sometimes that's providing transportation. Um, we've gone as far as buying our students alarm clocks. Whatever it takes to get them here because we know that um, their success is going to depend on them being present. For the coursework, we expect our students to complete the course 100% with 80% proficiency. Now, if a student falls below 80% on any type of quiz or test, we can reassign what they've gotten incorrect to make corrections. Um, if they're still falling below, we ask them to go back through the lesson, take notes, and we'll sit down and explain it to them maybe in a different way and work through it with them. And I would say 99% of our students complete 100% of all their classes with higher than an 80% proficiency. Um, the instruction here is mostly independent. Students work at their own pace through their coursework. I have 18 students in my classroom at a time working on 18 different things typically. Uh, we also use a blended learning model. Um, for instance, right now we've been working on geometry. I have a group of six young men and women in my class who all needed a half credit of geometry. And so we're spending time as a group working through it, as well as spending time on Odyssey there working through it. And then, of course, we, we also offer hands-on work, which comes in the form of field trips. 
So every month we take a field trip to somewhere different. Um, we went to Discovery World this year, which is a, a hands-on science technology type museum. We take them to the art museum where they get to spend time in the studio creating art as well as explore the art of different time periods from different types of artists. We take them to the zoo where um, in our Milwaukee County Zoo, there are over 50 poems scattered throughout. So students have done poetry scavenger hunts, and they've also worked on animal biology while there. Most recently, last week, we took our students to the Civil War Museum, and they um, did a scavenger hunt, finding information about the Midwest's impact on the Civil War. And then they came back to our school and they did some Odyssey work, Odyssey wear work um, from the Civil War units to earn a half credit. Um, the best thing about field trips is they're social, they're experiential, they're non-threatening. Students don't have to worry about being put on the spot or getting anything wrong. And many of our field trips at Connects were able to offer at zero cost to the students because we write grants to the Coles Cares Foundation. And every year for the last several years, we've received three $1,000 grants to go to the zoo and the art museum and Discovery World. Um, we also have some local companies. One is PPG, who offers grants to public schools. Uh, it's a very easy one-page letter that we have to write in order to be awarded that grant. Um, our next component at Connects is generosity. And generosity um, is very important for our students to learn to give back to their community. Um, a lot of teenagers think a lot about themselves and for us it's about getting them to think about others as well. And we always let them know that they're being afforded an amazing opportunity by attending Connects and they can pay it forward by awarding someone else the amazing opportunity of a gift of time. Um, it's important that our students learn about empathy, about understanding and feeling what others may be going through. And it's also important that they realize that generosity should be a true sacrifice. They're not doing it to earn credit. They're not doing it to fulfill any type of court requirement, they're doing it because they want to and because it intrinsically feels good to give back. And so we do a wide variety of activities every year. Um, we run a Pennies for Patients campaign every year, which benefits the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And students oftentimes will do a service learning project, so they will learn the science behind leukemia and lymphoma, and they will educate others while at the same time raising money. Um, I am fortunate that I have a sister who is also an educator, and she works at a middle school in the Oak Creek Franklin Joint School District with students who have cognitive disabilities. So every year we try to get our students together to work on a different project. One year we did a project um, for Project Linus, creating blankets for children who um, are suffering, children who are um, patients at Children's Hospital, and also for homeless women and children. So my students taught her students how to make the fleece tie blankets and they worked together on those and then we donated them to that local organization. Um, we've done other things like making stepping stones with the students. Um, they've made the paracord survival bracelets, which we then sold and donated the money to the Susan G. Coleman Foundation. We also work with a local elementary school, usually during fourth quarter. Our students walk a few blocks over and work with some five, six, seven-year-olds on reading and math and art. Um, which is also a wonderful experience because a lot of times students learn that they would like to be an educator um, working in an elementary school. So a lot of what we do is about providing a variety of experiences for our students because not only are they growing 
intellectually and social emotionally, but they're learning about their future and the potential it holds for them and all that they can do to give back. Which brings us to our final component, which is independence. Um, so for us, independence is about empowering others, providing choices, and giving guidance towards independence. And so we give a lot of leadership opportunities for our students. Um, we are not always, as the teacher, the one who leads the circle. We often ask the students to lead the morning circle or even the closing circle at the end of the week. Um, students will take the lead on several of the community service projects. Um, sometimes students help us plan field trips or make suggestions towards that. So all those leadership opportunities really help our students to grow and flourish. Providing choices is also very important. Um, the curriculum, they a lot of times will choose what they want to work on. They choose between packet work, online work, or field trips. Um, we've even had students who have created their own projects to meet the standards in order to earn the credit. And then choice of work environment. Um, our building is more like a college union. Um, it's laid back. We don't have a lot of rules here. Students listen to music while they work. A lot of them eat and drink at their computer or while relaxing on a chair. Um, we provide laptops and desktops. So there's a, a wide variety of ways students can complete their work in a lot of different environments within our building in which they can do that. And then finally, we, guiding independence is about the college visits and bringing colleges in. Every year we have a college fair where we have a dozen local schools come in and discuss with our students opportunities. We have four-year schools, we have tech schools, we have the cosmetology schools. Um, we have three, four branches of military that come in. It's important that our students know that there are a lot of options open to them. Um, and once they start to explore and think about maybe what they want to do, the motivation skyrockets because they then have a plan. There's a goal in mind. Um, we also offer volunteer-led classes. There's a local organization, Make a Difference, who will send volunteers from a financial institution to our school to teach our students about personal finance. So they learn about checking accounts and savings accounts and student loans, credit cards, fraud, all those things that will help them become an independent adult once they graduate from high school. Um, more ways students show independence at Connects is goal setting. Students set goals for their progress. Um, we start quarterly, but for some students it works better to do weekly or even daily goals. We do a lot of personality tests with our students. We do the Myers-Briggs, um, John, which based on their personality will tell them maybe some career choices that would fit uh, we use Career Locker, which used to be called WISC Careers, which again will give them an interest survey and a skills survey. And again, they can learn about um, where their interests lie, where their skills lie as far as future careers. Um, we take our students to some of the local colleges to visit. So not only is it great when the schools come to us, but when we can take them out into that environment and they can see what a college campus looks like and start to get excited about those things as well. We provide shadowing opportunities for our students. So we've had students who are, for instance, interested in the culinary arts. And a group of three students a couple years back have spent the day in a five-star restaurant preparing food like foie gras and other amazing things that they would never probably be able to try if it weren't for that opportunity. We've taken them to graphic design firms. They've shadowed electricians and carpenters. Um, they've spent time in different types of classrooms. 
And then of course, as I stated earlier, giving them opportunities to lead group activities. So it's, it's a wide variety of things that we do here. Um, we did not start all of this on day one. It's been a progression over 15 years. We continue to grow and as staff changes, new ideas come in, more energy comes in. Um, and it, it's been a wonderful 15 year experience. Um, here you can see some of the pictures of the kids working. So you can see we do have comfy chairs and the students do really kick back and put their feet up at times. Um, you can see some kids in a circle doing a journaling activity. We have high top tables and we still have traditional desks with desktop computers. So whatever environment the student feels most comfortable in is how the student works. Uh, some things that have informed our practice over the year are the, the books you see on the screen here. Um, and of course, many, many more. Um, site visits have also been helpful. Not only do we accept visitors all the time, but we like to get out into different schools to find out what's working at other places so that we may try that here as well. And so I think that's all I have to tell. I, I could probably speak for another three hours, but I want to give people an opportunity to ask questions. Great, thank you so much, Stacey. Um, you really went through a lot of information um, that I think folks are digesting. Um, it definitely was extremely interesting to learn about all the things you're doing um, there at the Connects Learning Center and just the amount of energy and um, caring <laughs> that goes into um, education you're providing those students. So um, thank you for sharing all of that. Um, as Stacy said, we definitely um, have less time um, for Q&A, so go ahead and send those questions in. We're going to um, let take, Stacy take just a quick little break, um, get a drink of water, and um, get ready for all those questions. So while she's doing that, I just want to let you know about two more Leading Change webinars that are coming up very soon. Um, on December 8th, we'll have Dr. Daniel Galchuk speaking about behavior screening and academic solutions. Um, and actually, the time on that slide is incorrect. I apologize for that. It's at 2.30 um, Eastern time. So keep an eye on your inbox um, for more information about that one that's coming up quickly and how to register. Um, we'll also have Dr. Galchuk um, join us again on January 12th to talk about blended learning and PBIS in alternative settings. Um, so two more great webinars coming up on the heels of this one we've had today. Today. Um, I'd also like to thank today's sponsor, Odysseyware. Um, as you heard from Stacy, Odysseyware provides educators with powerful and flexible online learning solutions that empower students in all kinds of learning environments um, to learn and excel. Um, so here's a couple of the different settings and ways that Odysseyware can be used, um, and you can learn more at odysseyware.com. Okay, Stacy. so we do have some questions that have come in, um, and we will get started with those. Um, our first one is, is there a curriculum that you use for your circle time? No, there is not a curriculum that we use. Uh, we do what's relevant at the time. So there are times where something has happened in the media or something has happened to a student personally and we will create activities around that. Other times, you know, we spend a lot of time online looking at different team building activities, um, icebreakers, a lot of times just fun things that we can do together. So no set curriculum on that at all. Although I do have a lot of resources, so if you want to email me, I can share those with you. That's great. Thanks so much for offering that. Um, one question about the school itself. Um, do you service special education students? We do. Um, it varies from year to year. There are years where we have as low as a 10% population. There was a year where we had a 25% population of students with IEPs. The staff here is not certified um, special ed education teachers. And so when we do have a student who has an IEP, their caseworker from the high school follows them. 
Um, they don't come here to work, but they come in once a week to check in on the student and they help provide us with resources to better educate that young man or woman. Okay. Um, also, just about kind of the operation of this school, um, do you have students that move from Connects back to the traditional high school environment or do most of them stay once they're there? Um, quite honestly, most of them stay once here, but that's not always the case. Uh, we have several students who will come during their junior year and want to have the traditional experiences their senior year. Um, and so we do, you know, once a, a student attends here, they're still considered a student of their home high school. So they still are allowed to do sports and they can do prom and homecoming and participate in those types of things. However, it's not the same as being in a traditional high school um, during your senior year and the energy in those hallways for some of our kids. So some do, you know, a year or semester here go back, but most of them, once they get here, they don't want to go back. Yeah, that makes sense. And it certainly sounds like a great learning environment for lots of these kids. Um, what do you do to promote um, the Connects Learning Center to students, teachers, parents? How do you let the district know about it? Well, because we have we have the consortium, um, so the the four school districts who meet monthly, um, the the directors of pupil services from those four school districts meet every month to discuss the program and things we can do better, um, ways to get it out there. But in our years, um, we kind of proceed ourselves. There are kids who will start school, and this is unfortunate, I wish kids wouldn't do this, but there are some kids who start their high school education and they've heard of us and how, how it's fun to come to school here. We do field trips, we do learning in a different way. And so they kind of solve their education so that they can get a seat here. Um, which I do not recommend for any student. But we don't promote ourselves in any way. Um, the only time that that is done, if a student is struggling, the guidance counselor will talk to the student and the family about our program. Um, we do have a website, which is www.connectslearningcenter.org. Um, but that, again, was just created this year as well, a couple of months ago, in fact. And so there, we, there's very little self-promotion, I guess. It sounds like the, the word is out anyway <laughs> about what you're, what you're doing there. So um, that's great. Um, our next question is actually about Odyssey Wear. And um, this person wants to know if you customize the curriculum to local and state standards um, or use the courses as they are, do you tailor them to the individuals? Kind of how are you using that curriculum? We actually do both. When we first obtained Odyssey Wear, we sat down with the teachers from Oak Creek Franklin Joint School District and worked with them to mirror what is being taught in each of the core academic areas. And so if a student is in junior English on Odyssey Wear, it is the same information that they would be receiving in the traditional high school. High school classroom, it is just delivered in a different way. And so we worked with not only English, but math, science, and history as well to customize all the courses that are being taught in the core academic areas. Um, as far as the elective areas go, we do a lot of customization to meet the needs and fill the gaps of our field trip courses that we offer our students. And for some of the classes, we just use them whole. So we use them as they came. Okay. Lots of flexibility there to do what you need to do for the students and, and the course structure. Um, does the school restrict access to personal devices, such as phones? Um, and do you filter the internet or have difficulty with students straying from the curriculum and the tasks at hand? Originally, when we started the program, uh, we did have trouble with that. Students spent a lot of time on YouTube and 
you know, different websites and surfing the internet or playing games. And then as cell phones became more popular over the years, that kind of became an issue. And I feel that um, the more we fought it, the worse it became. And then we kind of took the view, you know what, we are going to treat you all like adults, expecting you're going to act like an adult. We are putting your learning in your hands, and what you put in is what you're going, going to get out. So if you come to school and you put in your two and a half hours a day on Odysseyware, you're going to earn credits a lot more quickly and graduate a lot sooner than if you come in and spend the day texting, tweeting, Facebooking, doing all those things. And so once we laid it out there, and we do tell them directly in the interview, we're going to treat you like an adult, expecting you're going to act like an adult, we don't have those issues anymore. Students will go on to YouTube to pick a music station so they can listen to music while they work, but then they click back right into their Odyssey screen and they just work. So it hasn't been an issue. We haven't had to take away cell phones or do anything like that in a couple of years now. That's great. I think that probably ties in directly with the, the circle of courage philosophy of just empowering those students and, you know, in, embodying that personal responsibility. So that's great to hear. Um, this is also about time well spent. Um, how do you handle the push from administration to graduate kids on time instead of focusing on mastery? Um, quite honestly, there is not a push from administration. We are a very well-supported program. Um, and it, they understand, all four school districts understand that for us, it's not just about um, the academics, it's the social emotional component and educating the whole child. And for some students that takes longer than others. And they also understand for us the importance of not just graduating the child, but ensuring that they're set up for success in their future. And so we do not get a lot of pressure. Um, definitely the understanding is that these students need to graduate, but we've also gotten the you know, if they don't make it in June, they can come back September and October into a fifth year of high school as long as they're learning what they need to learn and they're prepared for their future. Okay. Um, this one's also about graduation. Um, and do you have any information or stats on how your graduates are doing in terms of going on to college and career and what kind of success they're having there? We do not have any stats, but we do have a lot of visitors. Um, I would say 80% or more of our students come back to us to check in and let us know how they're doing. And not all of our students go on to college. Um, not all of them are meant to. Um, a lot of them will go on to a two-year school. Uh, a lot of them MAT in the Milwaukee Area Technical College, some on to four-year universities, some go right into apprenticeships or into the workforce. And so it really varies. We do not have any hard statistics. Um, what we do have is we ensure that every student has a plan when they leave us. And life happens and not every student follows that plan but more of them do than not. And that's great that they are coming back to share their successes with you. Um, what kind of credentialing do the teachers have to be highly qualified? Both myself and my teaching partner have Alt-Ed licenses. My original license is in high school English, and I have the Alt-Ed add-on, and then um, I also have two master's degrees. One is the focus is alternative education. My teaching partner has um, K through eight certification with the alternative ed license, and he also has his master's degree. And then we have um, our pair of professionals. One just finished her master's degree in social work, and my other para has 
is a retired military um, officer who has had experience in a traditional high school environment as a special education um, professional. So we are all pretty highly qualified for our jobs. Yeah, and that's some great diverse backgrounds too that you're all bringing to the table. And we've had a couple of people um, ask for this, so if you're comfortable, um, some folks would like to um, email you directly. So if you wanted to give your email address, I could type it and send it out to folks um, via chat. That, that, that works for me, that's fine. Okay, so I will do that here momentarily, folks, and in the meantime, we'll get another question over to Stacy. Um, and you might want to back up a couple slides on this one, Stacy. Um, you mentioned Native American philosophy or methods for the circle, and folks are just okay. wondering some references um, for places and people to contact about um, the circle in particular. Okay. Um, you want to look at the Brentro, Broken Leg, and Van Brockern, Reclaiming Youth at Risk. Um, they are the ones who have really brought forth this philosophy and it, obviously we use it at our school. It's used at schools across the country and internationally. Every year they host a conference in Rapid City, South Dakota in June. It's the Reclaiming Youth Conference. Uh, I've been to it three times over the years, and it is always very amazing and inspiring. They also offer one in the fall, which usually takes place in Michigan, I believe. And then they also offer one in spring, which is in British Columbia. And so the three of them brought this to the front, and people all over the world are, are using this in their environments. Great, and just as a reminder, we will be sending out an email um, later today or tomorrow that includes a link to download this PowerPoint deck, so you'll have those references um, in that deck as well. Um, so what strategies do you use to integrate students who don't join at the beginning of the year and can't go to the, that initial ropes course, um, kind of get to know you um, integration session? Well, what we do usually is their first day. Um, you know, of course, they're part of the circle, and the students all go around introducing themselves one by one. They tell the new student their name, which school district they've come from, and one thing they like about Connects Learning Center. And then um, from there, it's just being a part of the daily circle. And even though they don't get that great experience of Camp Minicani, being a part of that daily circle within a week, they feel like a family member. And that's one thing I have to say about my students here is that they're always so good about um, welcoming new students in. Um, we've had visitors from other school districts, so adults visiting who they've never seen before, and they're really good about welcoming them in because they, they know that's our philosophy and our belief and that's what we're about here, that everyone does belong. That's great. Um, what kind of parental involvement do you have or do you encourage? Well, we always encourage parents to um, attend our field trips as a chaperone if they would like to. We also do what we call a monthly family meal. We have a little snack shop in our building where we sell snacks and we take the profits to buy groceries once a month. And then the students and the teachers work together to cook a meal and serve a meal and we sit down as a family to eat. And the parents are invited to that once a month. It occurs during the school day. Um, we also have our students write letters home to the parents letting them know how things are going here. And as far as the staff goes, we email or call or sometimes both um, the parents on a weekly basis to let them know how things are going. And generally when a student first starts here, you know, they're shocked because 90% of our phone calls are positive. We want to give them a lot of positive news about their student and all the wonderful things that 
they are doing here. Um, just so that when the student goes home and they hear, you know, their, their parent is finally getting good phone calls about them, they do even better when they come back the next school day. Yeah, that's great. Um, and, and I think that must make parents more willing to want to be involved um, when they're getting that kind of positive feedback and building that relationship with the, the educators. Um, do you know um, if other schools, um, more traditional learning environments are using the circle of courage and if they're getting kind of similar results as you're getting? Um, there is a local elementary school who has adopted the Circle of Courage um, as a traditional public school. I do not know if they are getting the same or similar results as we do. I do not know of any other alternative high schools or alternative programs in the area that use the Circle of Courage per se. Uh, many, uh, there are many in the area who use elements of it. Um, they just do not define it as such. Um, we've had a lot of schools who have started a school within a school or a program within their school who've come to us for ideas and we always share everything we do and we tell them, you know, this all stemmed from the Circle of Courage philosophy. So while they've put some of those practices in place, they don't necessarily specifically talk about the circle. Okay. Yeah, there's certainly elements of it that I think are used in all kinds of, of programs. Um, so you talked a lot about um, students having choice in their learning, and um, this question is just asking, how much self-direction do students really have? Do they get to pick all of their classes, or do they work with one of the teachers to kind of come up with their courses and their activities? Um, I guess, how much empowerment are you giving them? Well, for our students, they have to meet the requirements of their home school district. And so, um, they, they earn a high school diploma from their high school that looks like everyone else's diploma. So there are particular classes that they do need to take in order to earn that diploma. However, when it comes to elective courses, we sit down with them one-on-one -on -one and we talk about their areas of interest. And so um, Odyssey Wear offers a lot of those CTE courses. So if we have a student interested in a specific career, um, for instance, if they want to be a nurse, um, there are a ton of courses that um, will address that. And so when it comes to elective courses, students have a wide variety of choices and we let them choose. <laughs> Excuse me. Unless um, they ask us to choose for them. Required courses, their only choice is whether they're going to do it online or in packets. Okay. Well, that was actually our last question that has been sent in. Um, we do have a little extra time, so if there are any more questions, um, please go ahead and send them in and we'll get them to Stacy um, while we're waiting to see if there's any last questions. Um, I'll just remind folks again that um, you will be getting an email later today or tomorrow with the link to those PowerPoint slides and the recording. So you'll be able to um, get this reference list um, as well as feel free to, to share the presentation with any of your colleagues um, and maybe talk about how you could implement some of these strategies um, in your own school or district. Um, so it doesn't look like we've got more questions coming in. So I will thank you again very much for your time, Stacey. Um, this was wonderful information and it was so great to um, hear what you're doing there at Connects Learning Center um, and all the, the great work you're doing with these students and, and helping them um, you know, find their way and do well in the future. So thanks so much for sharing your information and expertise and thanks to everyone in the audience um, for joining us today. And actually, I, it always happens as I'm wrapping up, um, we get one more question. Um, so this is back to your reference list, and this um, individual is just wondering which reference best describes um, the implementation of the Circle of Courage. Uh, it is going to be the Reclaiming Youth at Risk, Our Hope for the Future book by Bentro, Broken Leg, and Van Brockern. Great.
All right, I'm going to start wrapping up again. <laughs> um, so thanks, everyone, um, and we hope that you'll be able to join us on a future Leading Change webinar, and um, have a great afternoon. Thanks again, Stacy. Thank you.